Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are going to spend some time in class today on this video lecture, the next installment in a series of what should be quite exciting video lectures on government and economics. Your favorite teacher here, Mr. King, back at you. I'm, I'm sure you missed uh, the soothing, melodious voice and this wonderful information. So today we're going to take a look at, uh, let me zoom back in there, the House of Representatives, the hot pot of coffee. Remember the metaphor, George Washington, our first president, could be a really good exam question. Explain that metaphor. I'm sure you guys remember it well. But anyway, here you have a shot of the uh, House of Representatives in full session and up above the gallery members. Um, I'm not sure whether this might be a State of the Union address. That could very well be. Uh, looks like some gentleman there is uh, clapping rather fervently in the foreground. But at any rate, we're going to get started so as not to waste any time. Um, so we're going to take a look at um, the party caucus today. Uh, if you remember the last lecture, we ended with the idea of the party whip and the different uh, leaders within the House of Representatives. And it's really um, each party chooses its own leaders. And of course, the majority party uh, has the most prestigious and powerful leadership positions, though the minority party also has um, positions uh, that mirror the majority party's positions, though they don't have the same decision-making powers that the majority party has. Today, um, the House of Representatives is controlled by the Republican Party. That was true after the 2010 election when the Republicans took control of the House from back from the Democrats. Uh, the Democrats had won control of the House uh, from the Republicans in the 2006 election. So in the last decade, there's been several switches um, in terms of who controls the House. Uh, currently, the House is, uh, again, to remind you, in control uh, of the Republican Party. That's probably going to be the case in the upcoming 2014 elections um, this November. We'll no longer be together, sadly. Oh my gosh, I know. Hey, can you believe that? I know all you guys are saying, wow, uh, you'll be with uh, far better teachers and in far better hands than mine. So just uh, hold on till the end of the year. But at any rate, um, what I want to do today is pick up with uh, the party caucus. And that is a funny sounding name, but caucus really just means a meeting. So a party caucus is a meeting of uh, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And it's really the caucus, again, meeting of the Democratic or Republican Party that selects the leadership. So at the beginning of the congressional session in January 2013, the Republicans are in charge. They, there was a Republican Party caucus. All of the Republican members met and they selected their leadership. You can see here the leadership uh, we have the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, it's a lovely green tie. I guess he's uh, going back to his Irish roots or something. I'm not sure. Wish I had a tie like that. Actually, kind of stands out. You know, makes a bold statement. Uh, the man to his left is Eric Cantor of Virginia, and he is the number two leader uh, in the House. Um, and those those are the the leaders that were selected. Uh, what's interesting is Boehner uh, and his leadership position were in doubt because of recent debates and divisions within the Republican Party, in particular over Obamacare and the ensuing government shutdown. Uh, John Boehner ended the shutdown after a certain number of days, uh, and, and many members of the Republican Party, uh, especially those influenced um, or inspired by the Tea Party, were quite upset that uh, Speaker Boehner agreed with the Democrats to reopen the government. Uh, so some of the Republican Tea Party members felt like the government shutdown should have gone on longer uh, in order to derail Obamacare. Uh, Boehner uh, was re-elected as Speaker of the House, so his speakership is still intact, uh, and he preserved that. So uh, we'll see whether he will be able to continue leading the Republican Party going forward. But the Speaker of the House, uh, again, to remind you, is a very influential position. They're the people that, in many ways, assign committee assignments. They, they uh, bring up bills or they block bills. They assign bills to different committees. They, they work with uh, members, um, and, and really, they promote the agenda and the platform, that collection of ideas, policy ideas of the Repar Republican Party. Uh, the Speaker will also um, meet and discuss issues with 
president, the executive branch, uh, negotiate uh, in many cases with the president over, again, policy issues. And of course, uh, Rep a Republican House, Republican leader uh, will uh, obviously uh, differ and disagree with a Democratic president, such as President Obama, over a number of things, from the budget to health care to uh, government spending programs, entitlement programs, and so on and so forth. So let's take a, a, a look at uh, rules, rules, rules. Who needs them? Who wants them? Who likes them? Not me, not you, but they exist. We can't get away from these rules. So um, we can look at this important topic, and yeah, it can be somewhat sleep-inducing, I know learning about the rules. Um, the Constitution, however, uh, allows for the House and also the Senate, when we look at the Senate, to make its own rules that govern, govern its conduct. The House can judge uh, member behavior and expel any member for almost any reason, really. So it sounds quite arbitrary. Um, and in fact, uh, they, they, they can expel members, though only five members have been expelled in the history of the House. Three of those members were actually expelled for having sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. The last member to be expelled from the House was a, ma a representative or a member named James Trafficant. Quite a fun name. He was a Democrat from the great state of Ohio. He was expelled in 2002 for 10 counts of bribery, obstruction of justice, and that lovely activity known as racketeering. Way to go, traffic man. Jimmy the traffic, trafficant man, uh, congressman. Nope, he got kicked out. Oops, last rep to be expelled from Congress. Wow. Um, funny story, my dentist, who is in Radnor Township, went to college with James Trafficant, and when I was having my teeth examined and, and cleaned by my dentist several years ago, he was trying to tell me what a good guy James Trafficant was and how he was really misunderstood that his activities were not criminal in nature. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't believe it at all. Uh, James Trafficant was not a very uh, savory individual, and he was kicked out of the House. Um, the last representative, uh, there's also uh, what, what's known as a reprimand, and you can see that's sort of a verbal scolding um, for misbehavior, misdeeds. Uh, the last representative to be uh, reprimanded was Laura Richardson, another Democrat from California in 2012, for using her congressional staff office uh, during her 2010 re-election. During re-election, you're not allowed to use your full-time paid staffers to help you win re-election. You have to go out and hire other staff members. She didn't do that. She she was reprimanded. And again, it's sort of a verbal scolding that you can see there represented by that image. The last thing that uh, can happen to members of Congress is a censure. And a censure is just a more severe um, statement of disapproval on the part of the House um, towards a member. Um, so censure is a, you know, not expulsion. It's a little bit more serious than a reprimand, um, but the, the, the member of Congress doesn't get kicked out of Congress. And the last member to be censured was uh, Charles Rangel, another Democrat of New York, for failing to pay taxes and improperly soliciting money from donors. Oops, bad reps. They make us all proud to be. Oops, no. Uh, they make us actually more distrustful of our national government. Um, but um, really, the incidents are far and few between, for the most part, when you have 435 uh, members. There's bound to be some tomfoolery and some, you know, some, some misdeeds, if you will, misguided individuals. Oh, well. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we've covered the rules. Oh, more rules. Oh, my goodness. Now we're going to take a look at the actual uh, House uh, of Representatives Committee on Rules. Good Lord. Who knew that such a thing existed? Now we're really going to get into sleep territory. Um, but there is uh, something called the House of Representatives Committee on Rules. It's a very powerful committee, although one not well known. Um, and, and this uh, committee um, kind of enforces the rules, can make and modify or amend rules of the House and also enforce these rules. Um, so let me just uh, gather my thoughts here. I'm using a script this time, which is actually proving to be more difficult. Um, but this committee, <clears throat> in addition to 
looking at how uh, members might behave and dealing with uh, playing traffic cop for the 435 bodies that run around and slam into each other on the house floor on any given day. Uh, the traffic flow problems, I tell you. Uh, this committee sets the rules for debate on bills being brought to the floor uh, for consideration. Uh, how, when, and for how long a bill can be debated. This committee also sets limits on how a bill can be amended or if it can be amended. The committee uh, on rules can speed up or delay passage of a bill. So this committee really is, though, again, widely unknown and underappreciated, uh, carries a huge amount of weight in the legislative process that, that goes on in the House of Representatives. And this committee uh, and the committee chair is usually very closely uh, allied with the Speaker of the House and is usually in the back pocket of the Speaker of the House. So when the Speaker wants something passed, he calls up his buddy uh, over uh, on the House Committee uh, on Rules and says, hey, Jack, get this done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the committees that do the work of the House. Um, 435 people trying to uh, examine, uh, consider, analyze specific uh, bills, specific areas of interest would be rather unworkable. It would be inefficient. It would take forever uh, to get anything done with 435 people weighing in at once, possibly. So what the House did, and again, the House makes up its own rules, it created committees. Uh, and those committees do the actual work of hearing proposals for laws, analyzing those proposals for laws, writing the actual uh, language of the laws, debating them, amending them, presenting to, then presenting them to the entire House for their approval. Um, so really the committee structure is quite important. Um, there are 20 standing committees. Yes, committee members are required to stand rather than sit while they work, so there's no slacking off. No, that's not really how it works. Standing committees uh, really just means that they are permanent as opposed to temporary uh, committees or ad hoc committees. Some of the biggies include budget, armed services, ways and means uh, that deal with taxes, uh, appropriations, um, and, and you can find a list of these 20 committees in your textbook, um, and, and of course the rules committee, which is quite important. Now each committee will also then be broken up into subcommittees. It's kind of confusing, right? And the subcommittees are to facilitate work uh, of the larger committee. Uh, and typically, each committee uh, in the House has four subcommittees. However, the Appropriations Committee has a whopping 13 subcommittees. Um, in addition to these uh, standing committees, there are select committees that are created from time to time to deal with spe a specific purpose or issue. Uh, they sometimes investigate suspect behavior or the poor implementation of a law. From time to time, there are also conference committees that bring House and Senate members together to study and analyze uh, Im important pieces of information and also to hammer out differences. Uh, between House and Senate versions of the same bill. Uh, and last, there are joint committees uh, that study thorny topics uh, such as uh, taxation. So a joint committee is really a House and Senate committee that get together to study difficult uh, committee areas. So you have standing committees, you have, um, let's see, standing committees, let me go back through my notes here, you have select committees, you have joint committees, uh, and those are the committees that, that we have. Let's take a look at uh, who runs the committees. Ah, do you know these gentlemen? Look at these guys. They look friendly, don't they? Silly committee chair people, right? Chairman. Oh, what? No women? I can't believe it. We're in 2014. And yes, there are, in fact, no female committee uh, leaders. So there are no chair women, just chairmen. Someday, Congress may wake up and change. However, committee chairs are selected by the leadership of the House. And again, the dominant, the party that's in the majority uh, has the leadership positions and selects the ch committee chairman. Uh, committee chairmen are, are placed on committees. Uh, it used to be done by seniority. Um, and, and so that the longer serving members of the House got potentially 
uh, powerful positions. Uh, committee chairs are incredibly influential and powerful. They're the ones that do the work of dividing up the tasks to analyze proposed bills, to study them, uh, uh, to debate them, to make changes and amendments, and to bring them to the uh, full House. Uh, however, in the 1970s, the House changed the seniority rules in order to allow younger, more energetic, uh, vibrant people, though none of these guys look terribly young and vibrant to me, although some have big cheesy smiles, um, to, to uh, become committee chairman. Committee membership, House members uh, usually serve on two committees and four subcommittees, and that's really all the time we have. Thanks.